Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today and uh, I'm excited to share some things with you. So first off, uh, my name is Andrew Hill. I'm the CEO of a company called Textile. Uh, you can find our primary product at textile.photos. Our website is textile.io. Um, both of those have a lot of links to our GitHub repos and our Slack channels and other places you can find us. Um, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm just Andrew X Hill. Feel free to shoot me any questions after uh, today's conference too. If uh, anything pops in your mind, happy to share answers about uh, anything I talk about today, the decentralized web, our plans to bring decentralized applications to mobile and uh, textile photos in particular. A uh, quick thank you to uh, IPF, IPFS Fund for inviting us to share today. Uh, it's going to be myself sharing and my colleague Carson is going to join me in a bit to share a bit about what we're doing on the community front with Textile, which is a really important thing for us and I'll explain a bit why that is. Uh, if you haven't heard of Textile, um, our mission is to reinvent mobile experiences uh, and decentralize the mobile web. Uh, a lot of people today are talking about decentralizing the web through uh, a, a number of different technologies. Blockchain is a key one, IPFS is another key one, and I'll touch on a bit of those today. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why we think it's important to bring those same ideas uh, to mobile and specifically think about solving problems for mobile. Um, so looking back at the beginning of the internet and the beginning of the web, uh, a lot of the technologies that were being built were actually protocols. So the ability to exchange messages. So uh, your ability to exchange an email, uh, your ability to exchange a file, your ability to look up a file on an external resource were handled through pro protocols that were designed to operate uh, on a decentralized system. And so really the foundations of everything that we're talking about today were really decentralized. But over the decades, uh, a lot of technologies came about and a lot of uh, different organizations building those technologies uh, created a centralizing force on the internet. And so if you think about the way that you uh, interact on the internet today, you can really identify many different points of centralization. So where do you, where do you go to check your email and send an email? How do you exchange money? How do you communicate with friends and build your social graph? All of those are mediated through central organizations. And this has actually been a very important thing for the development of the internet. It's allowed us to basically move very quickly in developing technologies that have enabled everything that you see on the web today much faster and much easier for end users than possibly it would have been if we stayed decentralized all of that time. But there are weaknesses of, de of centralization. And one of the biggest weaknesses is how centralized organizations uh, are responsible to their users. And so Chris Dixon has a really, uh, a really great blog post called Why Decentralization Matters. And I share the link there so you can find it. But what he talks about is uh, he calls the bait and switch. And so as centralized organizations uh, start out, as the apps and the companies that you interact with on the web get their beginnings, a lot of their motivation over the last few years has been to accumulate users. So for the past decade, um, if you think of the beginning of any new application that you've used on the internet that has been sort of a private company working to grow and scale and become a long-term company, some of their, most of their early motivation was on getting you to just use their platform. That was their way of proving that they would be successful. And so the beginning of all these organizations, uh, the platforms that they were building were really responsible to their users, uh, trying to attract them by giving them new values. So thinking of why you would join a new social network or why you would join a new dating platform or even why you might download a specific weather application uh, their responsibility was to make that the most attractive offering possible to you. But as those organizations grow, what they realize is that they can't accumulate many more users. So they've sort of hit the plateau in their growth curve 
of the number of users they can bring in. And so they realize the only way that they can continue to create more value than they made yesterday is if they find new sources of value. And what Chris Dixon explains is that uh, what we're seeing is most of these platforms end up using their flipping the relationship with their users. And so they actually turn their users into the product and trying to find ways to extract value from their users. And this bait and switch is really bad for most end users because it means that our things like our data and our privacy become, uh, become products for the, for the companies that we're interacting with. And so the current movement of decentralizing technologies and decentralizing the web really kicked off uh, in 2009 with the ideas of blockchain really becoming practical and uh, since then we have seen a real flourishing of companies trying to solve different problems of centralization so taking on different things that we were doing in a centralized way that didn't need to be that way and thinking about how we can reinvent them in decentralized ways mediated through the blockchain or through other decentralized protocols and what we see is that these companies are really assembling the pieces uh, of a new internet. Uh, they're all the building blocks that we need to reinvent uh, the way that we interact with technology. So at Textile, we believe that the battleground to decentralize the web is going to be on the mobile phone. It's really important to think about the way that we're decentralizing technology and that many of these early building blocks are necessary for us to get there. But in order to bring sort of all of the world's users to a new decentralized future, we need to figure out how to do it on mobile devices. And so uh, the reason that that's critical is, purely the is, is primarily the scale of mobile devices in the world. So if you look around in the audience, everybody has a smartphone. Everybody's using a smartphone. Probably some of you are using it to take notes or uh, interact with other people right now, but most of the world uh, is doing that same thing, right? And on our mobile devices, mobile apps are, uh, are a, a fundamental component of what we do on, on those devices, right? So um, the number of mobile apps that we're using is enormous. It's only expected to grow. If you look at the numbers behind how people engage on their mobile devices, you see it's predominantly in mobile applications. So um, one number that's interesting, for example, is how much people are using mobile websites versus mobile applications. And if you look uh, at the numbers, it's predominantly through native applications. So instead of going to a website and using um, a website that's been designed to run on mobile, people are downloading applications and engaging through them. The overhead to get people to download applications may be higher, but once people have an app, they tend to choose to use it. And so apps are really, really, are really, really um, popular and important to our mobile experience. And so if we talk about the world of decentralization, many people talk about decentralized apps or dApps. And if you think about the success of dApps that we've seen in the history, no place have apps been more successful or more prevalent than in our mobile experiences. So if we think about how we can make decentralized apps uh, apps uh, successful uh, and useful, we need to figure out how to make decentralized apps work on mobile. Um, and the other really interesting thing is that when you're building technologies for mobile, you're thinking a lot about uh, consumer applications. And what we've seen in history is that consumer experiences are very evolutionary. And so think about it again in terms of the social network. Was uh, the social, is the social network that you use the most today the first one you ever signed up for? Or is it one of many that have come before it and some of which you don't even log into anymore, some of which have died along the way? And so the success of consumer applications is, is very, very um, related to the failure of the ones that have come before it. And so it takes many different attempts to build successful consumer applications before one uh, strikes consumers in the right way and takes off and really makes a, a global success. And so we believe at Textile that in order to succeed at building the decentralized web, we need to figure out how to decentralize mobile, 
Decentralizing mobile, one of the first problems is how do we decentralize applications on mobile? And one of the problems of applications on mobile is that they're hard to build. They're, it's hard to build a decentralized application on mobile, and it's actually going to take many, many different attempts to build those applications before we get a few successes that really help us bring a lot of people to the decentralized web through their mobile devices. And so our mission, right, is to decentralize the mobile web. And so we see ourselves as a laboratory to explore how this decentralization could work. So if we need to build applications that run on mobile and are decentralized, we also need to figure out how to make the code that we're writing available to other developers so they can, they can follow in our footsteps, so that they can build the next uh, applications as well. And so we really, really see ourselves as researching these building blocks, figuring out how to make them run uh, in mobile applications, and then releasing them to other developers to use as well. We uh, right now are thinking about how do you tackle the primitives of the mobile experience. So if you think of any application you use on a mobile device, you can see it's actually, um, it's actually an assembly of, of primitives of the mobile experience that have been put together in some unique way and then have some uh, new and interesting layers on top of them. Uh, and, and that assembly we need to make really easy so that many developers can grab those primitives, put them together, and build a new and innovative application. So primitives, when I talk about primitives, I'm talking about things like your ability to um, log in, your ability to move your accounts across different devices, choose a profile or an identity, um, your ability to store and look up media, so your, your ability to create a video or download a video and watch that video, your ability to uh, create a contact and engage with a contact, so your social graph, but not just your social graph, the ability to actually communicate the protocols to do things like voice texts and uh, voice texts and videos. All of those pieces are the primitives. And you can imagine any application picking and choosing which of those primitives to assemble into a new app. And so as a laboratory, we're imagining how do we build those pieces? How do we make them work really well on mobile devices? And then how do we release them so that many other developers can assemble those? And so once we have those primitives, uh, we know that we can build applications. And so right now we're actually building a few of those primitives and are trying to build the first application from those primitives. We believe that if we build those and make them easy enough, we can get many applications. And once you have many applications that are, that are decentralized apps running on mobile, we are thinking of other problems that, can, that will come as we move up that ladder. So once we have decentralized applications working on mobile, we have users that are interested in using them, we want to find new distribution channels and even different platforms for them to run on that really uh, incorporate what we believe should be uh, the decentralized future of, of the mobile experience. So what are the primitives? I already mentioned um, these uh, just in passing, but we, we've already identified, say, about 10 different primitives that we think are the key things. But you can think of them in kind of these four categories that is media, storage, and exchange, identity, and authentication, your social graph and contacts, and then your communication protocols, so how you actually move information between you and services and you and other people. And if we can create those primitives, that's how you can build almost any mobile application on top of them. So in our building of these primitives, uh, we believe that we needed to showcase how they would work. We needed a place that we could prove that the primitives worked in a mobile uh, operating system and worked, in, worked uh, to create good mobile experiences. And so we started building what we call our keystone application. So our first application that is a proving ground of these primitives. And that's called Textile Photos. And so that's what I'm, what I'm sort of here to talk about. But I wanted to give some background on why we're building Textile Photos. So Textile Photos is a fully encrypted photo app. It runs on iOS, Android, desktop. Uh, it allows full end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of photos. So you can take a photo, encrypt it on your device, share that photo with another user, and it will, become, will be decrypted directly on their device. No intermediary ever has the keys or even holds the file for you outside of a decentralized network. Um, 
Inside of textile photos, we're developing a data wallet. So when you take photos, you can store those encrypted original photos in your data wallet, which is private and uh, available only to you through that private key that you're going to generate when you download the app. And we do this decentralized media uh, exchange. So one of the first primitives. So how do we move photos, encrypted photos in this case, how do we move them uh, across devices so that people can uh, store their photos, sync their photos with other devices, and share those photos with other people that they know. And we see textile photos as really our, our sort of field study, our laboratory for demonstrating how these building blocks, how the primitives can really come together and build good and be used to build, be used to build good user experiences uh, on the mobile web. And so we test these primitives in these different uh, elements of textile photos from the decentralized wallet to decentralized identity and decentralized permissions. So who's allowed to see a photo you share? And I'll get a little bit more into that in the, in the next slides. And we also think, so one thing that, uh, that is a layer on top of the primitives is that you need to be able to assemble the prim primitives into very good user experiences. So when you use your mobile device and you use a native application, there's a very small tolerance window for an application that gives you a bad experience. You'll always move from an application that gives a bad experience to one of dozens of other alternatives that have smooth, made, that, made that user experience more smooth and easier for you. And so in textile photos, we're also trying to demonstrate how these building blocks come together to construct good user experiences. And so what we actually think is the key, um, which is uh, a small catch-22 of building decentralized applications, is that when you build a decentralized application, you need to make that user experience so smooth for the end user that they don't even know that it's a decentralized application. Right? You want them to think it's just any other application that they're using, and they don't need to think about whether you, they're using decentralized or centralized. They should be able to um, experience the same quality applications in any, in, any, uh, in any app that we build. And so we're really um, studying that and trying to hone in how we build those experiences in textile photos. And so I want to walk you through the steps of how the technology works at a very high level here. And then I'm going to jump into a demo. And so you'll be able to see how these pieces are happening sort of on the fly for the user without the user even having to think about it. So when a user tech, uh, joins Textile, first thing that you're going to do is download the application. It's available, like I said, in um, the App Store or the Play Store. Um, if you actually just want to download it today and follow along, you can uh, just search for textile photos and you'll find it. Um, and we'll work with IPFS Fund to make referral codes available to anybody today. The um, key thing with uh, textile photos in the App Store is that it's by uh, invite only right now. So we'll get you those invites. So when a user joins textile, <clears throat> they download, download the application. And then when the application uh, launches on their, app, on their device, some things start happening that are invisible to that user. The first thing is that a new private crypto cryptographic key is generated on the device. And so this is, this is the user's private key that is only ever available to the user. It's never shared with any other server or service. And the user actually will need to back that up someplace off of the app if they ever want to be able to get um, if they ever want to be able to recover data in their app if they were to get logged out or lose their phone. Um, the, the key is actually a key pair, so they get a private key, which they'll never share, and then they get a public key, which they can share, and that can be used to identify them to other people so that they can do things like exchange media. Um, those, that private key is used to generate their data wallet, and that's the place all of their private data will be stored. And then finally, Textile Photos um, runs on IPFS. And so IPFS is our uh, media, is a set of, well, IPFS is a set of technologies and we use it in a couple different ways. But IPFS allows you to do things like move media across multiple devices through a decentralized network. It allows you to do things like um, uh, look up 
media. So if you have a photo that you've stored on your desktop that you want to be able to download to your mobile device and it's only in your private wallet, IPFS lets us do things like address that um, encrypted data in a very efficient way. And so when you download textile photos and run it for the first time and you've moved through each of these steps, the final thing it's going to do is create and launch an IPFS node directly in the mobile app. And like I said, that's going to be invisible to the user. So all of these steps will have more or less happen without the user having to think about it at all. Okay, so then you're inside of textile photos and the first thing that you probably want to do is figure out how you can interact with other people, your friends or your family. And so textile photos, if you think back on the primitives of the mobile experience, you can think of textile photos as being a replacement for your native camera roll. So it's a place that all of your photos that you take can be stored, but in this case encrypted and private only to you. And so then the next thing you want to do after you store a photo is possibly share it with a friend. And so the steps that a user might take when they share it with a friend is that they'll create a new a thread, a new thread. So we call um, these spaces where you share uh, photos, we call those threads. And so a user will create a new thread and behind the scenes what's going to happen is a new key pair is going to be generated specific for that thread that they create. Um, the user is going to want to then invite some external user to come join that thread and so behind the scenes uh, an invite block is going to be created on IPFS. And that's an addressable block of information that the user will encrypt with a one-time use key and be stored on, on IPFS so that anybody could discover that block, but nobody could see what's inside of it unless they had that one-time use key. Okay, so the next thing the user does is they'll actually just get a link uh, that they can share with the, the friend that they want to invite to the block. And so that link they can share through any other uh, system that they use to communicate with that friend. And so what we see is a lot of people will just text invites to threads. So the user will create a thread and the next thing that they'll do is get a link that they can text to a friend. And that link will say, hey, I have this thread, come join it. When the user clicks that link, it will open up in textile photos inside the app. The app will grab that block for the invite plus the, the link will contain that one-time use key. So the user will then go off to IPFS, get that private block, look at what's inside of it, and inside of it will be all the information necessary to join that private thread. And so then the, the friend will join the thread. And now the users can exchange photos in a private way. So that key pair that's generated specific to this thread in step two, now only those two users have that private key and they can actually write, each of them can now write photos and share them in this thread and only those two will ever be able to see it. Okay, so what happens when a user now shares a photo? Because now we have two users in a thread and we need to figure out how we can move information across them. So I'm going to take a photo and I'm going to share it with this friend that I've invited to the thread. So the first thing that's going to happen is the photo is going to be encrypted with a totally unique key, not my key, but a key only for that photo. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take that key and I'm going to encrypt it and store it in my wallet. Because that's my photo, I wanna always have the key to unlock it and see what it is. That photo, the encrypted version of it, is now going to be stored on IPFS. And the last thing that's gonna happen is because I wanna actually share that photo, I wanna give the other people in this, my other friend in the, in the shared thread, the ability to see the photo, I'm going to encrypt that private key for the photo with the threads key. And I'm going to share that to the thread. And so now anybody in the thread is going to get that key specific for my photo. They're going to be able to decrypt it with the threads key. Then they're going to be able to go get the encrypted photo and decrypt it with the key only for that photo. And so that, uh, that exchange happens really quickly now because all we need to do is, is encrypt a key for a photo with the threads key and share it to the peers of that thread. Okay, so that's sort of the high level walkthrough of what happens. So I think as the next step, what I want to do is actually go into a demo with you and show you how all those sort of complicated pieces are abstracted away. And as a user, you can just 
actually take photos and share them with friends and not think about the fact that it's totally private and it's so secure and it's end-to-end -end encryption and it's happening over IPFS. You won't notice anything in that in the app, but I'll explain a bit as we go. So let's take a look. Okay, so let me start with a nice fresh install of textile photos. Um, I just downloaded it. I'm just gonna go through the onboarding here. You can do that on your own. So here's where you would enter the referral code that we'll give you today. Um, but I've already got an account, so I'm just gonna sign in uh, my username, drop my password in here. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna take a photo. Yep. Cool, good enough. I can always change that later. Um, so there, okay, so there's my empty account. Um, it's gonna give me a little bit of information about threads and wallets, things we've already talked about today. So threads are the places that I can create private shared albums um, for my friends and family. And my wallet is where I can go and store all my own private data and always go back and manage and access it. Let's go ahead and create a private thread. So create a thread, I'll just call it houseplants. Okay, take a photo of the plant in the window. Okay, and I'll just caption that my first shot. Okay, so now what's happening is all the steps I talked about before being encrypted by a private key, that private key, uh, or then, sorry, it's, it's, it's going to be encrypted by the private key, it's going to get a unique hash, stored in my wallet, uh, and there we go. It exists in a thread, but I haven't invited anybody to this thread, so really it's only ever visible to me. Okay, but you can see now in my threads view, I have one thread called houseplants. Pretty simple, it was updated a little bit ago. But I'm going to hang out here for a second. I think my girlfriend is going to actually invite me to a new thread. And I'll show you how, that, how you create your own thread and invite other people to it in a second. But let's just see. Okay, so she just texted me an invite. If I click on her text, you'll see it's a little textile link. But when I click on it, it opens in the app and it gives me the option to join the thread. And when I accept, there it is. So she, she invited me to a thread called Weekend Adventures. Let me go ahead and add a new photo to this thread. I'll pick one from last weekend's adventure while, where we were hiking along the coast. And it was amazing. So I add a little caption. And again, it's being encrypted by the threads. Sorry, the, the key for this photo is being generated. And then that key uh, and the encrypted photo are being shared, the address to the encrypted photo are now shared to the Weekend Adventures thread. So now Justine has a copy of the address to that photo and has the ability to view it. And you'll see, actually she's already shared, me, shared with me a new photo, which is the view from our campsite last weekend. So now Weekend Adventures has three photos, the one that she shared to me and the one, uh, the two that she shared to me and the one I shared to her. So here in my thread, I can invite other people to it. So in house plants, I could actually just generate that link that I mentioned to, and I could share this back to Justine. You aren't limited by the number or types of threads that you have. They're sort of these living spaces where you can store and track your photos and engage with your friends. And so maybe Justine has another thread um, that's different than weekend adventures where maybe she wants to share photos with me. So this is a oop, little error, but fixable. So there it is. So she invited me to a new one called dogs. There's our old foster dog. Okay, so that's the basic overview of how textile works. And you can see very simple, smooth, and you don't even really have to think about all the complicated pieces. Um, but I want you to go ahead and try it out on your own. And we'd love to hear your feedback. and. Uh, and I hope it's interesting to you, so thanks.